Now, in order to know where the center of something is, you have to know its size, don't you? And according to mathematics, particularly according to geometry and trigonometry, if something's too big for you to physically measure, the only way that you can calculate its size, you got to first know its shape. Is that right? You have a different formula for finding the area of a triangle than you do a rectangle and a different way of finding the area of a circle. That's in plain geometry. Then when you get into sphere, into a solid geometry, you don't find how big a sphere is, a solid sphere, the same way you do a circle. You have a different way of doing a different formula altogether. So in order for these Egyptians to be able to determine the exact center of the land mass of the earth, they couldn't believe like them dumb crackers were telling Columbus, you're going to fall off the edge. They couldn't believe the earth was flat. They had to already know that the earth was round or spherical. <laughs> In fact, the term, the name, geometry, comes from the word geos, meaning earth, and meter, meaning measure. Geometry, the science of geometry, is based upon the measurements of the earth. Now, when you and I went to school, some of you are still going, but if you are, they're teaching you geometry. The geometry they're teaching you, no matter what school you go to, they're teaching you what they tell you is Euclidean geometry. Is that correct? Now, the word Euclidean is an adjective. That's a word that's used to describe something in order to distinguish it from something else that you might get it mixed up with if they didn't. So to say Euclidean geometry means that's to keep you from getting it confused with another geometry that is non-Euclidean. But why is it that you only know Euclidean geometry? If there is another geometry, and there has to be, why is it that you can't go to a school and learn it. <laughs> I looked in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and the one that I looked in, I wanted to make sure that I was on sound ground from white scholars' standpoint, is the one that all the scholars agree is the greatest version of Encyclopedia Britannica that's ever been printed. Okay? Uh, it's the ninth edition, printed in 1890. A lot of stuff in it they've snatched out since then. That's why it's still the greatest. Britannica says Euclid was a discoverer and a compiler. Well now, they would have us believe that Euclid is the father of geometry. If you discover something, that means it was already there. If you compile something, that means you just pull together something that already existed. So if Euclid was a discoverer and a compiler, he didn't create nothing. Now, it goes on to say, as the introduction of geometry into Greece is by common consent attributed to Thales. You ever heard of Thales? Oh, they didn't tell you about Thales. Now listen to this. He's the one that introduced them to it. But they tell us about Euclid. So all are agreed that to Pythagoras is due the honor of having raised mathematics to the rank of a science. Now look at this. We're learning Euclidean geometry. They're saying that it was introduced by Thales. Thales of Miletus. You can look it up. It was introduced by Thales and then perfected by Pythagoras but they don't teach us about nobody but Euclid, who learned from Pythagoras, who learned from Thales. <laughs> and who did Thales learn from? <laughs> Praise is due to Allah. Yes. <clears throat> Pythagoras, I want, you to, I want to show you a parallel now. We'll bring this right up to date. Pythagoras took Geometry, this is what they mean they raised it to the level of a science. He didn't just look at it as a bunch of numbers, but they called it number. They didn't call it mathematics at that time. They called it number. But Pythagoras examined that thing, and he said, number is great and perfect and omnipotent. 
and the principle and guide of divine and human life. This is what he thought of mathematics. All right, let's hear what the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said. Islam is mathematics, and mathematics is Islam, and can be proven in no limited time. Sound like they're kind of saying the same thing. If Islam is entire submission to the will of God, and mathematics is Islam, and Islam is mathematics, then submission to God must depend upon a mathematical formula. The wisdom of God has to have a mathematical base. <clears throat> Pythagoras even dealt with the power of numbers and where it got its power. I want to show you again, comparison. He pointed out that there are two kinds of numbers, odd and even. And because they are opposite, the interrelation of them is what gives numbers their power. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan talks about the power in the universe, and he speaks of it as a collection of dialectics. Have you ever heard him say that? Dialectics. That's what makes up everything. You got right and left. Good and evil, masculine and feminine, limited and unlimited, straight and crooked, rest and motion, light and darkness, singular and plural. Everything has an opposite. <laughs> now, I want to tell you what happened to this teaching of Pythagoras. Now remember, I'm, I've just drew up, I just got through drawing a parallel. What Pythagoras was saying in his crude way, what the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is breaking down to us in a very refined and detailed way. They didn't do anything to Pythagoras. But when Pythagoras got old and retired to his home, the Greek government went every place that they knew people were gathering and learning Pythagoras' teaching. They not only killed the people, they tore down the building. Even if it was just a house with a family, if they were in there talking Pythagoras talk, the government sent their soldiers in, they would kill the people and burn down or tear down the house. That's how dangerous that kind of teaching was to that civilization. Well, now here we are in an extension of that civilization. If you studied world history, you know that America points all of Western, the white folks. Europe and America point their roots to Greece. Is that correct? back to Rome, through Rome, to Greece. So now, if Pythagoras was treated that way because he was a threat then, how do you think the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is viewed now? But they have another, they have another scheme for him to try and defeat his purpose. They spent a lot of time and a lot of effort inculcating us with the Bible. And they know that we can't grow up in America without having some knowledge of it and some belief in it. So the Jews, some of y'all say, uh-oh, anti-Semite. <laughs> I'll be anti-Iraq if it threatens us. The Jewish press, newspaper, Dated Friday, August 14, 1992, just five days ago. In this article, the Jews are talking about their plan to rewrite the Bible. Why? Since they claim they don't believe in it, they're Jews. They, this is the Christian Bible, but they know we're not Jews. They know the bulk of our people are Christians and that we go by what that Bible says. But that Bible says a whole lot of things that the Jews can't be comfortable with, especially when the Honorable Louis Farrakhan says it. So, according to the Jewish press, and I quote, to prevent future Louis Farrakhans, <laughs> and radical right-wing racists from inciting the unwary to hatred of Jews, Many prominent theologians and scholars are recommending that future Bible translations be clarified. <laughs> They're going to retranslate it now because of our leader. 
Charles Obrecht of the Institute of Christian Jewish Studies in Baltimore states that changing the text from the Jews to the Judean leaders would be a good idea. Because eh? if you understand the Bible, and you can't sit under the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and not begin to see that bad boy for what it is. And when you look in there and see what the Bible really says about the Jews, then you see them for the first time as they really are. So now because the Honorable Louis Farrakhan has exposed them, now they want to go back and change the book. And where it says Jews, they want to change and make it generic. The Judeans. There's people who live in Judea, and they might be Arabs. <laughs> They had some Africans living in Judea. They had folks from all over the world living in Judea. No, it wasn't the Judeans, it was the Jews that hated Jesus and that lynched Jesus. <laughs> James H. Charlesworth, professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Sem uh, Seminary. Not cemetery, but that's what it is. He says, they quote him in here, the Jews must be translated more representatively such as Judeans, Jewish authorities, or the priests in Jerusalem. But it was the Jews. See, I know that all of us have been taught that the Roman soldiers crucified Jesus. That ain't what the Bible says. The Bible says Pontius Pilate turned them over to the Jews. Now, anytime there's a big crowd going on that is not sanctioned by the government, they're going to put some officers there for crowd control, right? That don't mean they're taking part in what's going on, the demonstration, whatever. They're there for crowd control. See that it doesn't get out of hand. Can't you see that there would be Roman soldiers there if the Jews getting ready to lynch one of, one of the people? Well, he said, no, but they had a whole bunch of Roman soldiers. Read your Bible. You want to know how many Roman soldiers were at the crucifixion? Read the story of the crucifixion in the Bible. Didn't it say that they cast lots to see who was going to get his robe? And didn't it say they finally decided they would divide it? Didn't it say that every Roman soldier got a piece of it? And didn't it say they tore it in four parts? How many Roman soldiers were there? It's plain. <laughs> so this is why 2,500 years after Pythagoras, the folks that tried to destroy his movement without bothering him is trying to do the same thing to the Honorable Louis Farrakhan today. Now, <clears throat> Thales, this is what the Britannica says about Thales of Miletus. Universally recognized as the founder of Greek geom geometry, astronomy, and philosophy. He never had any teacher except during the time when he went to Egypt and associated with the priests. Now this is the man that brought geometry to the white world. <laughs> Geometry, astronomy, and philosophy. But he went to the temple in Alexandria, and that's where he studied. Now, I just want to show you a contrast between that which we are taught by the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and that which we were taught by our enemies. There's a sign, you have it on your computers and you have it in mathematics. It means greater than, right? It means that the one over here is greater than the one over there. Now if you put a one here and put a sign there, every mathematician in white western civilization would tell you you got that wrong. You got that backwards. You say, well, Professor, why? So, no, five is greater than one. Let's find out if five is greater than one. <laughs> In mathematics,
there is a thing called a syllogism. And it's stated in words that things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. Is that correct? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals B. Because they're both equal to B. If they're equal to the same thing, they got to be equal to each other. Okay? We're together, right? Let's take that syllogism. Further, we say, Allah Wakbar, right? God is the greatest, right? We also say there is no God but Allah. God is one, right? If God is the greatest and God equals one, then one is the greatest. Come on now. Let's see. <laughs> Can't deny mathematics. That's mathematics. Now, we do a little back up on it, though. Just so you won't be nervous about it and think we just pulled the trick. Which is greater, something that is dependent or something that is independent? Independent, right? Okay. Now here's that five again. Believe me, that's the five. The one thing I never did good in this school was penmanship. I can do better than this. <laughs> Somebody might just be walking in the door and say, hey, There's that five again. Is it dependent or independent? Yeah. Dependent. Because you can't get to five without starting at what? And you take another one, another one, and you get up to five. But one don't need the five. One doesn't wait for the two to come into existence. One doesn't need the nine. Doesn't need the eight. Doesn't need the... One is independent of all of them. Tell me it's not the greatest.